I was a Christian Bible thumper. I practically lived in church. I learned the Bible very well, and I woke up, I went to sleep, and I dreamed everything about God and Jesus. My family is a big military family. My brother joined, my cousin joined, my father was in the military, my uncle was in the military, so I joined the military too. My brother was in the army too, he was stationed in Alaska. I was stationed in Korea, the opposite ends of the world, right? But subhanAllah, every week we will call each other. So we're talking, and he said, oh yeah, you know, I have to tell you something. I'm like, yeah, well, what is it? He's like, I'm Muslim. I'm in disbelief. And then I just start crying. So we hang up the phone there. So I said, all right, I know my Bible. I'm going to study this Islam and I'm going to use it to bring him back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All right, brother, what's your name and where are you from? My name is Jacob Marino. I live in Yonkers, but I will have to add, I was born and raised in the Bronx. But yeah, I'm a 15 year resident of Yonkers now. Okay, so what was your experience like growing up? I grew up in the 80s in New York City, the quote unquote crack era. And you know, it was quite an adventure because all I saw in the South Bronx was destruction. It, it looked like a war zone, torn down buildings. There's a picture, a famous picture of like Jimmy Carter looking like lost, exploring the Bronx because it was so bad. And that was my childhood, destruction and negativity all over the place. But alhamdulillah, I had, you know, good parents that uh, kept me, you know, either by the whip or by, <laughs> or, you know, by stern talking on, you know, on a good path. Did you always believe in God? I always believed in God. I was a Christian Bible thumper. Let me tell you. I remember my mom, I remember being four years old, five years old, and her telling me about heaven and about, you know, one day she's not going to be here, but we'll be reunited in heaven. And that always stuck with me. Uh, even as I remember, four or five years old, and I still remember it to this day. And then when I was around nine or 10, my father really put me into it. Church was everything for us. Every Sunday in church, uh, you know, I practically lived in church. I learned the Bible very well well and I woke up I went to sleep and I dreamed everything about God and Jesus as a Christian everything was all about my religion and uh, you know I so God was always in my mind in my heart so much so that you know like again growing up in the Bronx you know in that era I was taught not only by my parents but by my faith you know don't lie don't cheat don't curse I stood out from my friends they used to call me like at, at 10 years old you're an old man because <laughs> I didn't want to like do mischievous things with them just, you know, God is watching me, you know, so I, I was always, you know, cognizant of God. So how did you hear about Islam and what attracted you to it? In New York City, it's a melting pot. So we have everything. So I was aware that there were people called Muslims and they wear funny hats and, you know, and they don't eat pork. And they had a, they have this prophet named Muhammad. That's all I know. That's the extent. And honestly, I think that's the extent of today of non-Muslims, what they know about Islam. But I was aware of Islam in that much in New York City. My brother had Muslim, a Muslim friend. Uh, there were Muslims, you know, in my, my school, in junior high school and high school. So I was aware of them. So, you know, as a Christian, I used to say, uh, that's just a, a, a desert religion. But that's my, my train of thought. That's a desert religion. And so as a young man, you know, I... I went, you know, I graduated from high school. My family is a big military family. So it was inevitable that I was joining. My brother joined, my cousin joined. My father was in the military. My uncle was in the military. Everybody's in the military. So I joined the military too. And so um, when I was stationed in Korea, and subhanAllah, it's amazing that now that I think about this, my roommate was Muslim and he had the Bible open. And I was like, you're Muslim, why do you have the Bible? And he was like, oh, you know, he, he started talking to me, all oh, contradictions and this and that. And I used to be, you know, I had the veil over my eyes. I'm a Bible thumper, man. I'm like, nah, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He's my roommate, you know, we're in the army. My brother was in the army too. He was stationed in Alaska, the opposite ends of the world, right? But subhanAllah, every week we would call each other. You know, we grew up with each other. Uh, we had a big family that, uh, you know, because of some circumstances we were split up, but him and I always were together. And so one day, one conversation, it was a Friday, I remember, because the weekend's coming up and now, you know, I'm going to get a little two-day pass. So I can leave the, the, the base. So we're talking and he said, oh, yeah, you know, I have to tell you something. I'm like, yeah, well, what is it? He's like, I'm Muslim. And I, and I can still hear it the way he said it. I'm Muslim. And I'm quiet. And I'm like, I'm in disbelief. And then I just start crying. And I'm crying. And these are not tears of joy, brother. I am sad. I am thinking, how can he betray us like this? How can he do something like that? You know, um, I'm in denial. 
And, you know, he, he told me, this is, you know, I found Islam and this is what I want to do. So we hang up the phone there and, you know, I, I'm questioning everything, you know, how we grew up. Because remember I told you that we were, I, I you know, Bible thumper or something. He was with me, you know, we were, we, were, we were hand in hand in all this, you know, in Christianity. And for him to be a Muslim now, it was just so shocking to me. And my roommate's Muslim too. So I said, all right, I'm going to see what this Islam is about. Because I know my Bible. So I'm going to study this Islam, and I'm going to use it to bring him back. That's, that's my plan. Um, so that starts a little bit of a, a little adventure for me. Tell me when the moment you realized Islam was for you. Um, I have to preface the answer with this, because I, it's an integral, integral part of my journey. And it's, it goes along with my brother. So in the army, I'm studying Islam to use it against Islam. And in the army, so I, I, I you know, I, I go where they tell me to go. So I got orders to go to Iraq. So I'm like, oh man. So before my, my deployment to Iraq, you know, I'm doing my studies. I go on, online and I start downloading a lot of different things about Islam. There's this one specific thing that I saw. I don't know if you remember Napster and stuff like that, that you can just download anything. A lime wire. There were things that you could just download without paying for it. So I put Islam and I, there was this one thing that's in Arabic that, and it's connected with Islam. So I download it and then I play it and it's Arabic. I don't know what it is, but I just burned it on CD. I'm going to take it with me and doing my studies. So here I am. I go to Iraq. And so Iraq, I'm there for a year, 365 days. When I first arrived there, I'm thinking I'm only going to be there for maybe two months. After two months, they told me, no, no, we're here a year. My heart went from here to the ground. I told myself I'm not going to survive. It was hard enough, brother, to make it to those two months. Because every day I'm thinking, when I wake up, today is going to be my day. It's my last day on earth. And to feel that stress and, you know, it, it was overwhelming. So at the end of the day of whatever I'm doing, any mission I'm at, you know, I come back to base, go back to my little, my little tent. I am so numb because I'm too stressed out. So I get my CD player out, put my headphones on, and I start listening to that uh, Arabic thing that I, you know, that I downloaded. And it's calming me down. All right. So it's calming me down. And, you know, and for the moment from when I press play and it's maybe like a five minute thing, I'm lost. I'm not in my Iraq. I'm not on that, the, the, that in that tent. I'm in total safety and I'm, you know, I'm good. And so it's like a, a refresher for me. I'm good. And so I do that every day. Whenever I'm feeling really, really stressed out and and every day I'm telling you today, every day is my last day. I am going to die. And when I realize that in the day I'm still alive, I, I'm sh even now I'm shaking a little bit. Uh, I just play that little 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 thing, and it's like a reset for me. So fast forward, you know what? I, I I got my orders that I'm going home. Subhanallah, I I made it. I made my whole tour without a scratch. I come home, and um, I don't come home the same man that I went over there. Came home bitter, angry. I came home a different man. I uh, lost family members because I pushed them away. I just didn't want to do. I didn't want to do with anyone. I wanted to be by myself. Isn't what I know now is post traumatic stress. And so you know, I'm a loner. My friends who used to call me the priest, because again, I never cursed anything like that. I came back like a, you know, like a drunken sailor, so to speak. I was as a one eighty. And I'm like, you know what? I don't want to study anything. You know, the, the, my little little thing that I wanted to do with Islam with my brother. I was like, I, I gave up everything. But those stressful moments were still there. And so I would every now and then get that CD out. I go into my car and I just, you know, close my eyes and I listen to it. And that would, again, that's my reset that calms me down. So eventually, you know what? I put that CD away. I'm living my life. 20 years after I came back from Iraq, brother, 20 years later, this is about COVID era. I forgot to mention during my little studies, I met a Yemeni brother in one of the bodegas in New York City. Uh, he gave me a Quran. And from the day he gave me the Quran, I've been through all over the world. I mean, when you travel, you lose things here and there, but I always had that Quran with me. Um, always. So, okay, so 20 years after I came back from Iraq, I'm in my house. I looked at that Quran, a lot of dust on it. I took it out. <sighs> 
there's dust everywhere. I, you know, like I'm coughing. I said, you know what, I'm going to read this. I'm going to read it. And so I read it, you know, Surah Al-Fatiha, all the way to chapter 114. And so when I finished the Quran, this was maybe like two or three days before Christmas. I got in my car, my wife, I dropped her off at work. She works in Manhattan. There's a masjid in Manhattan. There's a big masjid. I told myself, if there's a parking spot, because, you know, in New York City, there's no parking anywhere. I said, if there's a parking spot near that masjid, then I'm going to park and I go in. If not, I'm going home. As soon as I get this, subhanAllah, a parking spot right across the street. I said, all right, yeah. I said, all right, God, do you want me to park? I'm going to park. I park in, park in, I go into the masjid, talk to the brother. I'm like, yes, you know, I want to. I want to talk about, I want to learn about, I want to talk about Islam. You know, he's all, oh, the imam's on his way, the imam gets there. And I tell him, yes, you know, I've been, I read the Quran and, you know, I, you know, I, th I think I want to go toward Islam. And the imam was like, okay, you know what, take your time, learn more. And then you know, when we come back, you can take your shahada. I said, no, I'm ready now. I want to take my shahada. So he said, okay. So I took my shahada. Uh, I met my brother soon there, right there that same day. I called him. He said, I got to meet you because remember, he's Muslim. It was 1998, I remember, he became Muslim. And so he was so happy, you know, you know I'm Muslim. And, and I started, you know, I, I'm in my path. This is December, so I'm, you know, they gave me a lot of pamphlets, and it's so overwhelming. And, and then the transliteration, I'm like, oh, I'm reading something. I'm like, wait, this, this sounds familiar. What I'm reading, you know, how to pray. This sounds familiar. I said, wait, well, I'm home, right? I said, wait a minute. I go into my closet, into my archives, all right, and I dig out that OCD that I haven't listened to in 20 years. Put it in, I press play. When I press play, it said, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahmani Rahim Maliki Yomiddin. It was Al-Fatiha. It was Al-Fatiha that I listened to every day in Iraq. That gave me calm. It was al fatiha that I listened to when I came back and I was battling with that post-traumatic stress. It was, the, it was the words of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that as a non-Muslim gave me the comfort and the, the peace that I needed at the time. Thinking that today I'm going to die and Allah said, you know what, listen to this. And so realizing that it was al fatiha I said, well, I already know how to say it. <laughs> And I've been Muslim for five minutes, you know, subhanAllah. So, you know, it, I tell myself this was, you know, all this time for 20 plus years, you know, I had the veil over my eyes. I, you know, I was, I couldn't see Allah, but I realized Allah saw me. And, you know, he allowed me to live as a kafir for those 20 years. Because sometimes I say to myself, I said, you know, and I don't question the color of Allah. He wanted me to be Muslim at the age when I have gray hairs, right? I said, imagine if I was a Muslim as a young man. But I said, no, no. Allah wanted me to be a Muslim at this age. As a matter of fact, I learned, and this is the beauty of Islam. When, I, when you keep learning more, it's so beautiful that 50,000 years before the creation of everything, Allah ordered the pen to write that Jacob is going to be a Muslim at this age. Not at 20 years old, because maybe I would not have accepted that uh, the Islam at that time or understood it the way I do now as a older man so yeah so that uh, that really uh you know realizing that the yeah, al-fatiha helped me all these years it was really it gave me an iman boost so that in a nutshell was how i got to that point in islam so when you took your shower how did it how did the experience feel i remember like i was so nervous thinking about my family because out except for my brother Everybody, they were Christian, all of them. And uh, before my shahada, the conversation with the imam, he's like, you know, is anybody forcing you to you know, do it? I'm like, no, this is what I want to do. And I said, I told him, I said, I know that, um, I told him, I know that I'm going to hit brick walls. I know that I'm going to have problems. I know that they're, I'm going to hit a lot of bumps in this road from within my home and outside. But I can't deny the truth anymore. I can't because, uh, you know, I don't want to walk on this earth blind like I have been, knowing the truth now. And so there was fear, but not fear of Islam. That part I was, I wanted. I, I definitely wanted that. It was fear of the external things that I knew I was going to have to deal with. Um, family, friends, um, which amazingly being, you know, being Puerto Rican, I'm a minority in New York City. Now I'm a Muslim. 
That's a two times a minority, right? <laughs> but as a Puerto Rican, I, you know, little micro uh, racism, you, you know, you get to experience in New York City. But again, New York City is so multicultural and multi part. There's Puerto Ricans everywhere, Dominicans everywhere, Arabs everywhere. So people are used to something, they really ignore it. But as a Muslim, you know, sometimes I wear my, my, my kufi. It was the first time I really felt <laughs> and experienced racism. I had a brother. And I say brother, it was a, a black brother, African-American. I guess he didn't like what I was, you know, how I looked. He was like, go back to your own country. I'm like, come on. Well, I'm from the Bronx. I can take the D train up there, you know. <laughs> but, you know, that little experience, I said, I said, subhanAllah. I'm like, you know, this is just one little taste of, what you know, what, you know, Muslims are. Uh, and this is a little taste of what Muslims are dealing with, you know, in America. How did your life change after becoming a Muslim? Sounds like an oxymoron, but it became easy and hard at the same time. It became easy because now life, there's a framework there already. Uh, you know, there are things in life that I don't have to think about because it's there. How to be a good husband, how to be a father, how to be a good son. I got to tell you, my father, my relationship with my dad, if I saw him once a year, that was a lot. Pre-Islam. I didn't want to see him. Remember, I didn't want to see anybody. I, I threw away everyone from out of my life. And as a Muslim, let me tell you, my relationship with my father is beautiful. I see him all the time. I, I, I will have, the best way to say it is I'm fulfilling the role as a son, according to the Quran and the Sunnah. And by doing that, and I, I do it without thinking because this is what we're commanded to do. And it's so easy to do. And you know what? The byproduct of that is happiness. Because now I got my dad and I'm happy and, you know, uh, I'm flourishing, you know, with my, my son now. And now my, my father, he's, 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 uh, he knows his grandson. So that's the easy part. The hard part is, you know, the trying to being the only Muslim in my immediate family is, feels like I'm on a desert island. I love my wife. I love my son. I love them. And my son is three years old. And inshallah, he'll, you know, continue uh, with Islam. But... Uh, Feeling I, the hard part is feeling like I'm in the desert island because when I fast, I wake up and I do fajr by myself, sahur by myself, breaking my the fast by myself, eid and by myself. That's hard. That's so hard. But subhanallah, I will say, and this is the color of Allah. One month after my shahada, I'm in my local masjid and I see, I think it was something like a little poster or something like that, and it was co partially covered with the Imam Wesley reverts reconnect and zoom. I said, oh. Well, I'm a revert. I said, well, let, me, let me try to, let me, let me see what, what's, what's this about. And so Zoom, and I don't know anything about Zoom, but this is the COVID era, all right, post-COVID. My wife knows all about Zoom. I'm like, what is this Zoom? I oh, download it on your iPad. Can you do it for me? And so she sets it up for me. And so, the, the, you know, the little phone number, whatever, she, whoop, at the time and place, I logged on. When I logged on, I see this Imam Wesley there and brother Abdul Rashid, just us three. And, you know, I tell him who I am. Let me tell you, that was three years ago. I've been Muslim humbly like three years. From last three, of, there's three brothers there. From those three brothers, if you go today to Reverse Reconnect Zoom classes, sometimes there are hundreds of people on it. And that's such a blessing from Allah that that little desert island feeling that I get sometimes, you know, is it, it, taken away by just logging on or by just calling. Um, knowing that though physically some of the brothers are far away from me, we have a WhatsApp group. We just, you know, uh, say, listen, brothers, I'm feeling this. or what does this mean? And then two in the morning, three in the morning, somebody's up. You get a response right there. And so I get that connection there. So that that's like, you know, the uh, the medicine for the loneliness as a Muslim there. Nevertheless, you know, you know, I'm still right there by myself. You know, I try to go to the masjid, especially during Ramadan to break my fast. But because of circumstances, I do it by myself. And uh, alhamdulillah, my wife there were days she fasted with me and, you know, she makes sure she makes some halal food for me. So that's great. So, you know, it's, you know, it's gotten a lot better three years as a Muslim. And inshallah, when I'm 30 years as a Muslim, inshallah, things will be a lot brighter than what it is now. I try to convey this to new brothers to learn as much as you can, because you, when you when you think you know something and you really don't know, that's going to be a heavy burden on your shoulders. So the prayers, I'm like, okay, five times a day. How am I going to, what if I'm here and what am I supposed to do? And, you know, what if I'm nowhere near, you know, uh, uh, I was so stressed out. What to do? So um, there's this Instagram page 
It's called Places You Pray. And they showcase people praying any, everywhere and anywhere. Brother, when I saw that, just the first picture that they posted gave me such an inspiration to like pray anywhere. From that point on, I said, you know what? Wherever I am, I'm gonna pray. And, th and then when I learned that, you know, the window of prayer you can, you have, I love soccer. So I'm in Yankee Stadium watching my soccer team. When I get the notification it's time for Salah, I told my wife, I'll be right back and I'm praying in Yankee Stadium. I don't care who's looking at me. The subway, the, the Yankee Stadium, like I said, the library, anywhere I am, when it's time to pray, I'm going to do it. And so that fear that I once had the biggest part of the problem, it vanquished. Allah has alleviated that for me. So, again, the biggest fear became uh, fun, I should say. How did your family and friends react to your conversion? A lot of them are confused. They don't understand Islam. And so when I tell them, I say, you know, Moses and Aaron and Noah, you heard of those people? Well, those are prophets. We have that in Islam too. Even myself, I'm guilty of it. Prior to becoming a Muslim, I was thinking that Islam was something like a religion from Mars, you know, something akin or close to Hinduism, which after just looking into Islam, you see that it's, you know, the purest monotheistic religion in the world. And so I still have a lot of friends and that don't understand that. So little by little, I, I try, you know, whenever we get together, I, I let them bring the subject up. I don't, I don't, you know, I say to myself, I'm just going to be who I am. I'm Muslim. I'm going to be Muslim. If they ask me, I'll, I'll, I'll answer their questions. And so I do. And so inshallah, you know, that, that little, little seeds are planted, at, at least for, so for tolerance, if anything else. So there's still confusion there, you know, like, listen, I'm not going to go to the bar with you anymore. Sorry, brother. If you want to go to the, the coffee shop house, we can do that. Let's do that. But, you know, not, you know, th just a few things in my life has changed. There's certain places I'm not going to go with you, but there are great substitutes that we can do. Family members, you know, there's a lot of denial there on their part. A lot of denial, like, no, nah, no, nah, it's a phase. It's a phase. So, but then I said, you know, my brother's been Muslim more than 20 something years. And, you know, I've been Muslim three years so far. And so, you know, if it's a phase, let it be a phase until, you know, I'm in the, in the grave. Yeah. Um, so that's still a, a little bit of a, a minor bumpy road with the friends and family. But inshallah, you know, things will be, you know, we need some construction guys to smooth out that road, you know. <laughs> what would you say your favorite thing about Islam? The fact that it makes life so easy. I mean, it's so easy. Like as a Christian, you know, when you steal something, stealing is wrong, obviously. You're going to get punished. It's a sin. Grain of rice, million dollars. It's a sin. Boom. You're getting punished. In Islam, there are minor sins. There are major sins. But I discovered, subhanAllah, that a lot of act of ibadah, you, your minor sins are being washed away. You go to do, will do. Your sins will be, you know, washed away. Do two raka, the sins will be washed away. Smile at somebody, that's charity. Your sins will be wiped away. Um, and so I say, this is a win-win situation. There's no way, you know, if you understand that, uh, you know, the path becomes even clearer to me, you know. So as long as you actively understand, you know, try to stay away from these sins. Just because it's easy to cleanse the, 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 the minor sins don't mean, it doesn't mean, you know, do it. But it just means, you know, follow a bad deed with a good deed. At least I know that, you know, my plan of action, it, it exists there. So, um, you know, again, like, like I said before, the, the, the framework of life is there too. Easy. I don't have to worry about, you know, how I'm going to be the good father. The, you know, the Prophet Wasallam, he taught me how to do that. So now I can focus on other things in order to, you know, better my, the life of my son, my wife, my family, and, and worship Allah even better. Um, that's one of my favorite things about Islam. What's your favorite thing about Allah? My favorite thing about Allah, you know, it's amazing that it's my favorite and at the same time, I don't understand it. His mercy. Because everywhere in the Quran, most merciful, most merciful. And then the Prophet ﷺ taught us that, you know, there's a, wo a woman with her little child and there's a fire there and she wants to protect her son from that fire. All right. Allah has more mercy to, f f toward us than that, the mother to her child. And I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around that. Because that mercy is so beautiful. I can understand the mercy of a mother. Something more than that is like, uh, the only way I'll understand it is inshallah when I'm entering the gates of Jannah. As you know, when, inshallah, I'll understand it. But just the, 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 the journey to, to try to understand it is, you know, I love that about Allah. His mercy is just, it's just like, a, you know, again, the descriptions, are, even the descriptions of the mercy is, is more than, than, than the universe. Uh, it, it's so great. What would you say uh, uh, one of your favorite hadith or verses in the Quran? 
I would say this, that, um, I'll paraphrase. Uh, you are not a believer until you want for your brother what you want for yourself. When I first learned the wording of the hadith, subhanAllah, I, I, were already, I was already experiencing that from the other Muslims. And then it made sense. I'm like, wow, that's why they're, you know, they're, 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 they're doing so much for me because it's like they're doing it for themselves. And, you know, I love it so much because it's, it really builds brotherhood. It's the, uh, the cement. That is the cement of our brotherhood. And that's the cement that will keep our ummah together. If you were to follow that hadith right there, you know, truly, I mean, and everybody, imagine this world, how it would be. Because we got to be honest, you know, you know, our deen and I don't know, let me rephrase that. Our faith and iman is the spectrum. Because even me, there are high, high days and there are low days. And we have Muslims that, you know, are Muslim by name. And there were Muslims that are Muslims, you know, or believers. But if you just follow the hadith, you know, if you, even if, if your faith or your man is, is, is low, follow the hadith. Go out there and give, you know, if you have to travel two hours to give your brother a bottle of water, then do it. Because you will want that bottle of water. And so that is my favorite hadith, you know. And I try and I ask Allah to always help me implement that in my life. Uh, not only to my blood brother, to all my Muslim brothers. And honestly, even to humanity. Uh... Because we have, you know, living in the West, living in, in America, you know, 99% of my neighbors are not Muslim. But if I implement that, and of course, you have to be, you know, I cannot let, I cannot eat and have my neighbor hungry. So if I were to implement that hadith towards my non-Muslim neighbors, not only is that a form of da'wah, but it's, you know, the rewards are there. Again, win-win situation. Uh, one of my favorite hadiths. Why should other people learn about Islam or consider becoming a Muslim? For non-Muslims... Tolerance. Tolerance because, you know, we have the benefit living in America, especially in the New York metro area, of knowing people of different faith of, and different religions, different religions and different uh, ethnicities and different races. So the, the more you learn about somebody, the more tolerant you can be with them. And what comes with tolerance? Peace and happiness. And it reduces hatred and it reduces ignorance. Because I was a victim of ignorance when it came to Islam. Let me tell you, ignorance was off the charts. Um, but even as a non-Muslim learning about Islam, saying, I remember thinking, man, this is beautiful, you know. This is nothing like, you know, what they're saying on TV. Nothing at all like the movies portray. So tolerance is a, it's a good byproduct of learning Islam um, at, the, at the lowest level. M more than that, if you want peace in your life, let me tell you, you know, I spent 26 months in the military, on foreign ground, you know, that does something to you coming home. And the peace that I get from Islam really helps. And I got to tell you, if it helps me, you know, it, it can help you when you you can't get your, your, you know, your coffee in the morning, you know, and if you're irritated, it's going to help you. If you could ask Prophet Muhammad so if you saw him anything, what would it be? You know, when I first became a Muslim, I was aware who the Prophet was. And I admit, I didn't love him because I didn't know who he was. That's what's very important for Muslims. Whether you're born Muslim or reaver, it doesn't matter. Study the seerah and learn about the Prophet and learn the trials he did. Uh, learn the mercy he is to the world. And one of the things that sticks out on me is that when he went to Taif and reading that, how they treated him and pelted him with these rocks, that there was there was blood in his, uh, you know, in his sandals. That hurt, my, that hurt me so much. Even thinking about it, I just, I don't like it. You know, I wish that that didn't happen, but because it happened, he was asked by the angel, if you want, I can take this mountain here and just crush him. He said, no, because perhaps their offspring will become believers. And look what happened. They became Muslim. And I will ask him, how did you get that mercy? How were you so merciful when, when these things, horrible things happened to you? How did you keep it together? Because we need that. I need that. Because every day, you know, you know, I... There's nothing that happens to me or anybody in this world that hasn't happened to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he handled it in a way that is really, it's perfection. And so we have, I want to mimic that way. Um, you mentioned you were in the military. Um, were you able to grow your beard? How did you go about that process to do it? When I realized that the beard is Islam, sisters have hijab, brothers have the beard. When I realized that, and, and, I, and, I realized, and I knew that this is how I want to follow this. I went to my commanding officer and I explained to him, I'm Muslim now. And, you know, as part of my religion, I, uh, want, to, I want to grow my beard. Man, you should have seen the look at his face, man. 
<laughs> you know, it, it was like confusion and like, you know, like, get out of my office. But he didn't say any of that. He didn't say none of that. Like see it in his face. And my first, uh, my first, we have a first sergeant, which is, uh, I was enlisted. And so my commanding officer is a commissioned officer. And so my, a first sergeant is the highest ranking enlisted um, uh, troop uh, that is supposed to be our representative and the advisor of the commander. So that my first sergeant's there too. So the first sergeant was like, all right, these are the steps you got to do you know, in order to, uh, you know, maybe go that way. In my mind, I'm like, these guys are trying to stop me. In my mind, I'm like, I'm going to win this battle one way or another. And so he's giving me a hard time, let me tell you. He barely gave me the steps of how to do it. So, but you know what? I knew one of the th ways to go is go to the chaplain's office. All right. Every branch, no matter what branch you're in, they have a chaplain's office. And the chaplain, for those that don't know, is um, is the, whether it's a priest and an imam too, they have imams and a rabbi and they're a member of the military, but that's their role. And they're legit, you know, member of their faith. And they have, um, the, and in the chaplain's office, they have, you know, you know the workers who work with them of various ranks. Set up an appointment with the chaplain and they explain to him, this is what I need to do. And I ask him, what do, what do I need to do in order to get, you know, I want to grow my beard. And he was aware about Islam a little bit, but he referred me to his assistant. And may Allah bless the assistant because he, you know, not Muslim, but he is true to his job when it comes to, you know, people and practicing their faith in the military. He said, all right, let's, I have to interview you to make sure you're sincere. Because a lot of guys just want to grow a beard and just look cool. Yeah. So he, let's set up a date to, you know, for the interview. And we did. So he asked me, you know, about my sincerity, about Islam and what I knew about it. So I'm telling him, and he knows all this because as a chaplain's assistant, they have to study every religion. So that way they can help or assist those members of the ser of the service that are of that, those religions. So he knew uh, that, you know, first of all, I was telling him everything that is right. And in his opinion, I was sincere, which I was. So he said, okay, this is what we need to do. Uh, there's a packet we have to fill out. There's a request forms and all such a thing. I'm going to help you with that. So the chaplain's office is essential because you're not going to do it by yourself. Uh, the chaplain's office has to endorse everything uh, and then send it to the commander, my commander. And then, and then from there, believe it or not, it has to be sent down to the headquarters in, in Washington, D.C. This dude didn't want to, my commander didn't want to sign anything. He was giving me the, you know, he was trying to do the red tape uh, thing. Delaying this, delaying that. And so I told the chaplain assistant, I said, this guy's, playing, this guy's playing games with me. You know, what can we do? SubhanAllah, in my situation, in the chaplain's assistants that, that I knew, he knew people, very well connected. That's why networking is really good. He made a few phone calls and they called. So one way or another, the commander, my commander said, you know, and I'm paraphrasing. And they say, brother, uh, see that piece of paper that's on your desk? Put your rubber stamp on it. This is a courtesy. We don't need you. Hurry up and do it because we don't want more attention from us. So it was, uh, he signed it um, and there are stipulations in it. He signed it and uh, it was endorsed. And then it has to go through different, you know, different ranks to the base commander, which is a colonel and where I was. And so he endorsed it. Uh, and so, alhamdulillah, I'm like, good, I can grow my beard. So I'm walking around in uniform with a beard and people looking at me like, who the hell is this guy? You know, like weird because you don't see that. You don't see that. But again, it's a form of dawah too. Because they will ask me, you know, well, you're Muslim now? What is that? And you know, I'll tell them, you know, this is what Islam is. And so there were a few brothers that actually, and I can see sincerely, were, want to know more about Islam. So I told them what I could. Um, but alhamdulillah, yeah, you know what? I, I couldn't grow more than two inches, but the beard was there. But then there was a, st then they changed the, the, the rule that you can grow as long as you want to, but then you have to roll it up to appear to two inches. I said, oh man, they opened a door for me, man. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it got to the point where, you know, I was nearing my 20th year in the military and I said to myself, you know, you know, I got my little son. I want to focus more uh, learning the dean because this is taking too much time away from from that. So I told my my chain of command, I want to retire. You know, I don't want to be that weird guy in uniform with a beard anymore. You know, <laughs> uh, and so I put in my retirement papers and um, I honorably retired from the military with a beard, walking around in uniform. Uh, so I say to like a lot of brothers who are in the military, who want to grow their beard, go to the chaplain's office. It's a smooth process, especially in this day and age. Go to the chaplain's office and you have to be sincere. They want to make sure that you are sincere, not, you know, you just want to be the cool guy with the beard and thinking you're special forces, you know. But yeah, easy process, you know, I, you know, it took, it was some bumpy roads for me because of my specific commander, but you know, they're genuine, you know, if you have a genuine, you know, uh, sincere commander that wants to care for his troops, he wouldn't give you any problems. And if he's not sincere, so what? The chaplain's going to help you. So that's the key right there, the chaplain. 
Okay, think of this scenario. It's the day of judgment. Where would you hope your meeting with Allah would be like? It's funny you ask me this question because I think about it every day. Lately, every day about the day of judgment. 50,000 years worrying. I say to myself, you know, you know, I, I'm looking, I imagine my scales and I want my good deeds to be heavy. So I keep saying, you know, subhanAllah, subhanAllah. I said, do thicker. So at least, you know what, while I'm thinking that, I'm like, let, let me put more weight on it because I'm scared. Because it doesn't matter how good of a Muslim you think you are, um, nothing's guaranteed. And so I, I, and then also the Sunnah prayers, you know, because the first question is going to be, how were, you, how, was it, how were your prayers? And I know I'm not perfect. One way or another, I'm, I'm messing up. So I try to do my Sunnah prayers because I learned if I didn't, I'm not up to standard with my thought prayers. All right, let's look at the Sunnah prayers. And so I, I would want it to be smooth. I would want, I ask Allah for His mercy because it doesn't matter what I do. Because the only way to, to get past that and to Jannah is through His mercy. Because uh, even the Prophet ﷺ said, only by Allah's mercy am I going into the paradise. And if the Prophet ﷺ is saying that, who am I? So I got to work hard. I got to work really hard. And, and and I would hope that when I'm standing there, you know, and I get nervous about this. I want it to be smooth. And I want to hear you're forgiven. And I want to hear salam alaikum from the angels as I'm entering paradise. That's what I would like to do. So that's how I envision it. But those 50,000 years, brothers, you know, <laughs> I hope, you know, not too much sweat is coming down my, my forehead, you know. Uh, so inshallah, it, 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 smoothly, it will go smoothly. Inshallah. Thank you, brother. Uh, may Allah reward you. I mean, uh, I mean, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Barakallah fikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.